Welcome, Wargamers, to the deceptively rich lands of Aya, because today we're talking about a very specific location, and that is the kind of region known as Rismark. This video is based on a recent uh, lore spotlight on the area, and I wanted to focus on it because I, I think it's a compelling story. It parallels uh, our real world in such an interesting way. And if you don't know, this is an area that is largely maintained by the 100 Kingdoms, the human faction. Of course, there could be other factions in the area raiding, marching, whatever they need to do, but this is largely owned by the 100 Kingdoms and, and thoroughly settled. And so we're going to talk about the history of the region, a brief look at its development, and really ask, why is this cool? Like, what does focusing on this one area or region of the world map really add to conquest lore? Now, one thing I'd like to add right up top is if you like this video and you're interested in uh, 100 Kingdoms or really anything to do with Conquest, please consider using the affiliate link in my description below. You will save 10% on all of your purchases no matter what, and using that code also goes a long way to supporting me uh, as a content creator. So it saves you money, gives the channel a tip at no cost. It supports me, my wife, our cats, everything. Thank you so much to everyone who has already used it. Now, for those of you who are new to Conquest or, you know, really the idea of like Parabellum's universes as a whole, as we mentioned before, this region is kind of populated by the 100 Kingdoms, which is kind of the baseline of humanity. They really are sort of the, uh, the jack of all trades, master of none. Just regular Joes against some of the craziest horrors to ever come out of like dark fantasy. But to say that it's one faction is a bit deceptive. It's more of a conglomerate of human factions. It's called the 100 Kingdoms because it's made up of individual little fiefdoms and that kind of stuff. So not only are they trying to fight these horrors outside, like outside threats, but also internal politicking, fighting over land and limited resources. It's like Game of Thrones if there was like a lot more, I don't know, aliens and ogres and stuff. But this particular region of the 100 Kingdoms is home to particularly 11 major kingdoms. There might be tiny things within them, uh, but there's essentially 11 rulers of the Rismark region. So let's move, you know, kind of from the, the faction as a whole to talk about this area. So like the rest of the Hundred Kingdoms, Rismark was founded by refugees running from the collapse of the Old Dominion. There was likely some early settlers before there because the fall of the Old Dominion wasn't necessarily a singular event. It kind of teetered out. So I'm sure there were some like basically colonists who were coming over here or frontiersmen and setting up a little bit of kind of a rudimentary shop, but there wasn't a real population in this area until the Old Dominion fully fell. And that's because this land was largely unwanted. You see, the region of Rismark is defined by waterways. In fact, the residents of the region claim that like the word Riz, R-I-I-S, comes from like an old term for rivers. The article has some like counterclaims as to the origins of Rismark, but it would make sense because the region is defined by water, specifically rivers. You see, roads are expensive and, and very hard to build. And again, this is a shattered society and people who have to start over again in a lot of those kind of civic ways. So roads really aren't on the table for this region, especially because it's a lot of swamp land. Like it's very hard to build sustainable, uh, I should say dependable road systems. Because the land is swampy, it's also very hard to farm. In fact, this area was largely unpopulated until rice began, began to spread throughout the 100 kingdoms because they could be rice farmers that uses an incredible amount of water, if you've ever seen rice fields before. And it was just like the perfect source of food for this particular area. So once that happened, then like the raw materials of civilization are there, right? We have ways of transportation through the rivers, but they lacked a lot of the, the substance that humans need. Well, now we got food. Because remember, when the collapse happened of the Old Dominion and everyone just shotgunned out of that region of the world map, they lost just about everything, including the deepest knowledge of agriculture. In fact, this is what makes this other faction, the city-states, meaningful is because they prepared by hoarding information, but the average person did not. So all their books, all their study, unless you had someone who was a lifetime farmer physically with you, that information is gone. And so because of that, things in Rismark kind of plateaued for a while. They, they began to do like subsistence farming, be able to take care of themselves, but it was really slow going when it came to evolving 
the culture and the societies enough to be able to start exporting things. It was an area where unwanted people just kind of showed up into a miserable wretch of a region and had to like live off the very few natural resources that existed. It was a hard life. Minor warlords would fight over the land, but they didn't have the infrastructure to form modern kingdoms. They couldn't keep the roads working, and so each empire basically worked to master the riverways. Most trade and transportation is done by water rather than roads, which is a massive hindrance to how much you can actually ship things to and fro. And so within this unwanted land, as we mentioned before, there's 11 major kingdoms, all fighting over the same scraps. And these are the places that are listed on our map here. But that all changed with the discovery of vast iron and gold deposits throughout the entirety of the region. It's not really made clear like what prompted a very specific discovery, like if there was a particular mine that they realized was just way bigger than they initially thought or what. But overnight, Rismark went from a swamp water, you know, region full of rice farmers to one of the most valuable regions in the entire 100 kingdoms. Because as they are rebuilding their society, those raw materials, things like iron, copper, you know, any kind of precious metal or gem or jewel that is used in craftsmanship, all of those things are of vital importance. They are immediately irreplaceable. And this is actually, I think, pretty well demonstrated gameplay wise. When you look at the actual roster of Hunter Kingdoms units, things that are clad in like iron or steel or something like that are, are just way the heck tougher than anything else. So like even mechanically on the table, you're like, oh, okay, well, metal is important to these guys. It's the source of tools, armor, weapons, and so on. And, and they need every little advantage they can because they're facing these indescribable horrors that are like aliens and alien creations and half mutated alien like project rejects from the Nords. Like there's a lot of things going on. So you need at least some good weapons. And so this discovery across the entire region immediately made those 11 kingdoms wealthy. They went from nothing to having just about anything, because even if you didn't have a particularly large mine on your region, the idea is that the whole area of Rismark has a lot of iron and, and that kind of stuff. But even if you didn't have specifically the biggest mine, if you control one of the very few waterways, which is the primary way to travel and trade through this region, you make money just by being in the orbit. However, before they got a chance to really enjoy this wealth and kind of lavish it upon themselves, uh, they quickly realized something, which is that we need to be able to keep what we have. Like, these were all warlords that people forgot about. There were other larger, more advanced, you know, civilized, quote unquote, kingdoms within the 100 kingdoms, and they could easily just come in and snatch up the region of Rismark. Because as it stood, each one of those 11 kingdoms or fiefdoms could be taken by many other kingdoms within the 100 kingdoms. And so now the goal is, how do we move from the prey category into the predator on, on like the civic scale? And now we move into the current political landscape. So if you're going to build an army from Rismark or invading Rismark, if you're uh, whatever, any faction really, this is what it looks like. Those 11 provinces banded together. They properly defined borders, trades agreements, and they formed the semi-united Rismark that we know. They're still independent kingdoms but they do work towards a common good to make sure everyone stays profitable. Because if they didn't unify, they would lose everything that they just gained. And that's not to say that they're super peaceful. I mean, they still have internal skirmishes and, and miter confrontations regarding like who controls this area of the waterway. You know, there's like internal strife, but there there's nothing like actual armies marching from one of these minor kingdoms to another in, in, a, in a large sense. I'm sure there's room for that lore wise. But overall, Rismark tried to retain what it had and not show any weakness to the other rest of the 100 kingdoms. And because of that, Rismark sovereigns, I'm going to quote the actual article here just for a little bit, retained a strong cooperation before outside threats and its people have forged a strong sense of common identity. They are, in fact, one of the most recognized cultural groups in the modern kingdoms. They defined themselves, they drew a line in the sand, and they're like, listen, I don't like my neighbors, but I like them a heck of a lot more than I like anybody else who thinks they're going to walk into my property and take all this iron. And at the end here, I just want to throw in a few other cultural things just to kind of give you some tidbits if you are looking to 
have your army be from or in Rismark. Uh, a lot of the people in the region, again, they are a very well-defined cultural group, call themselves Marksmen or Markmen. The idea is, I'm a person from Rismark. That's me. Within then, they have a loose kind of description, kind of like we would say like a country boy and city boy kind of thing, like where you're de denoting what kind of like regions they come from. They have the Reismen, which generally live in castle towns and chain stations on the rivers. And then there's the Marquini, who generally live near the fields and the mine towns. So you're, again, rural, urban. And so why is learning about Rismark cool? Again, it's just one small portion of the 100 kingdoms. Well, I am a sucker for historical correlations. And this is something we talked about um, a couple months ago. I did an interview with the head writer and big guy at top at Parabellum. We talked all about lore their inspirations, what drives them. And uh, one of the things that they definitely emphasized was picking out key pieces of history where momentous things happen. And you don't necessarily see that on paper, but it really, really was. And I'll give you an example of a historical correlation here. Nations that discovered oil at the end of World War II. It changed everything overnight. Because vehicles weren't super big before then, but once they did, all of a sudden this new resource entered the world stage, and this thing that went from not entirely worthless, because of course it still had like lubrication purposes, but went to becoming ubiquitous with mechanized warfare, which would be defining the Second World War, it immediately changed the entire political landscape. This is when we saw the rise of the Middle East uh, mega powers regarding the rights to the oil mines and that kind of stuff. America was booming off of the oil reserves we had. Just a whole bunch of stuff. But that's kind of how I viewed this story is like, what if there was a region of the world that generally speaking, for whatever reason, people look down on, whether it's a racial reason, whether it's an economic one, you know, obviously the geography is very complex here. But then overnight, they get like, they win the lottery. I mean, as a nation state, they win the lottery and you immediately become a new predator and prey because now you have the resources to be able to eclipse other smaller kingdoms, but at the same time, you have a huge target on your head for anything bigger than you. And again, that's one of those stories where it doesn't look like much in a history book, but if you lived through those things, it would be momentous. Now, each of the 11 regions here is big enough for you to have your own story from. Okay, you can do whatever you want. The Rismark has a lot of different landscapes. You've got swamps, mountains, watersides, forest, rivers, all that kind of stuff. And there's enough information here for you to make some really compelling lore. I'll try to remember to leave the link to this specific article down below if you want some more details. But honestly, like, you get the broad strokes from this. You could have a location, of course. You could pick a region within Rismark. You could define their relationship, uh, or at least your commander's understanding of the other 10 regions that you are not a part of. How does geographical location affect the way you do warfare? Are your people rich or poor? Like there's a lot of cool decisions that you can make uh, based solely upon the lore in this article. So I highly recommend you go check it out. But friends, that's gonna be it for me. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today and I will catch you in my next Conquest lore video. Happy Wargaming.